All right, guys. Thank you guys for coming to Open Control Dis at Open Source. Uh, so um, today we have a lot of good. Uh, we have a good lineup, and to get things kicked off, we have Randy Byers from Juniper Networks, the VP of Technology and Strategy. So um, let's give a hand for Randy. Hi. <clears throat> So, fair warning, I'm uh, sick and sleep deprived. I made the mistake, or I don't know, maybe it wasn't a mistake of bringing my family with me because uh, I was doing a two week trip. And so, they, my wife and my 17 month old baby, got sick on Saturday, and then I got sick yesterday. And so, she woke up, you know, screaming at 3 a.m. this morning for like a half an hour before I got back to bed. So um, I'll do my best, it might not be my A game, but um, I, I promise that at least what I have to talk about will be interesting. Sound good? All right, so let's go. So this is just a quick um, overview of kind of the arc we're gonna uh, talk about today. Um, I am trying to tee up the rest of the day um, so that um, some of the presentations will be in context. And I'm also trying to tee up the Open Contrail users group tonight where we're gonna talk about some really important things about how we're growing and leading the Open Contrail community, which I think has been a source of uh, angst for quite a few people. So, um, <clears throat> you know what, I should have asked this at the beginning. How many people know who I am? Raise your hand. Okay, so most of you. So just a real quick introduction for those who don't. Um, my company, Cloud Scaling, was one of the founding companies for OpenStack in 2010. And then I built it up and I had two marquee customers, AT&T and Walmart, um, both of whom had 25 rack deployments. Um, and then I sold it off to a company called EMC, which you probably have heard of. So I've been in the OpenStack thing from the very beginning. And then before that, I've got a long storied history uh, around infrastructure and cloud. To give you another example, and I'm trying to not give you my whole biography, which you can find very easily with Google, um, but to give you another example, in uh, December of 2006, when I was working on my first startup, we were using this open source tool that you probably have heard of called Puppet. And at that time, the Puppet community was about 30 people. There was no Puppet Labs. Luke was living in Tennessee and working from his home. Um, and we built an orchestration system around Puppet so that you could deploy an interior web app in a DevOps style onto a, a little system called Amazon Web Services Elastic Compute Cloud, which at that time was in beta, private beta. And you could order a single size VM for 10 cents an hour and that's it. No EBS, no load balancing, no Route 53, like none of that, right? So I've been doing this for a long time um, and cloud is my specialty. And if you Google for me, you will get a ridiculous amount of information that you don't wanna know. So, <clears throat> um, why that's interesting and why I wanted to talk about it before I go into this slide is that um, in the early days, um, there was a company that was a second company of public cloud that I was a CTO for called GoGrid. And I started engaging around SDN at that time with a company called Nasira. And that was in 2008, right? So software defined networking hadn't been coined as a term. DevOps hadn't been coined as a term. Um, we were just looking at these, uh, at these overlays and saying, you know, this is really interesting technology. What can we do with it? And for me, you know, I was just always skeptical. All right, what am I gonna do with this overlay, right? It's adding a lot of overhead. You know, it's maybe gonna slow things down. I don't know if I'm gonna get as much visibility into what is going on at the physical layer. What do I wanna do when I troubleshoot? That was my primary feedback to Martin Casado and, and Steve and um, the Nasira team As I said, look, you know, if we put this in place, like suddenly like a lot of the tools that I have for troubleshooting network problems like don't work or don't work very well because I can't make connections between what's happening in the virtualized abstraction, the overlay and what's happening at the physical layer. Like that's really important, I need all that tooling, I need the operational pieces. So, you know, I've been skeptical about overlays for a long time and, and now I work in the Contro business unit of Juniper, right? And part of that and part of why I started to get comfortable with it is that sometimes technologies have a time and a place and people deploy new technologies and they're just not really ready. And so the realization I came to over the last year is that, you know, there's actually a killer app for SDN overlays, right? It's like virtualization. The first time I saw VMware, I said, why would anybody do this? Like, I don't need to virtualize, you know, and put multiple servers on a, on a x86 platform. And then I had my aha moment eventually what the killer app was for VMware. That's another story. 
Um, but the point was is that what I've seen to, in the past year is sort of the aha moment. And, I, and you'll get a taste of that today when Riot Games presents later, I think, at 3 o'clock, 3.30? 3 3.30. 3 um, so Riot Games, and I don't want to spoil their thunder, but what they did is they said, look, we've got this great abstraction called Compute, and we've got this great abstraction called Open Contrail, or, sorry, again, I'm sick, this great abstraction, Compute abstraction called Containers, and we've got this great network abstraction called Open Contrail, and if we marry these things together, then suddenly, you know, our developers can uh, write to a single kind of uh, framework as a common system, common abstraction, and then whether that is deployed on top of public cloud or private cloud, nobody cares. And so I think that if we look at SDN overlays and the complexity they add um, in both uh, deployment and management and troubleshooting, suddenly having them as sort of a, a network abstraction is sort of a killer app. So you can imagine something like this. You can run overlays everywhere. You don't care. It's in a classic legacy bare metal data center. You could run them on top of public cloud, right? Why use Amazon Web Services VPC if it's significantly different from Azure's, if it's significantly different from Google's? Instead, you could have the same security and network semantics across all the public clouds. Oh, and also in your private cloud, whether it's VMware or OpenStack or just legacy bare metal systems. And what that allows you to do is when you've got the same network and security semantics everywhere, is that it means that applications suddenly can be much more portable. Maybe this doesn't solve all portability problems, but it solves a lot of them, right? And so this is why I think the SDN overlays are about to come of age. Um, and I think that I want to paint you a picture of why that's really important. So the title of this topic is, you know, of, of this presentation is, you know, can we build a global ubiquitous network fabric? Well, if overlays can run everywhere and give us sort of a common you know, uh, system for having networking, regardless of what the infrastructure is, regardless of what the underlying network architecture is, then really interesting things happen, right? It means we can suddenly deploy them everywhere globally, right? We can make them ubiquitous. We can make sure that they run on top of anything, right? A, a bit like TCP IP. I mean, some of you are probably old, ha old network hands. Anybody remember IPX, right? Right? Where's IPX now, right? Other than the US military, right? I mean, there's a tremendous amount of value in having the same type of uh, systems, the same types of protocols and standards that are deployed everywhere. Suddenly, if you're trying to build things on top of that common set of standards or protocols, it gets a lot easier, right? And so I think that that's the, the picture I want to paint, right? What if SDN overlays are not just this thing that's in your cloud? What if they're a thing that's basically wrapping the entire global network and giving you the freedom to run an overlay, uh, basically anywhere you want, right? To create your own networks anywhere you want, to manage them any way you want. Another way to think about this is if you, I don't know how many of you are in the carrier space, but they've got this thing called MV, I'm, I'm new to like all the carrier stuff, so I've, I've been learning all this stuff. And um, they've got this thing called uh, MVNO, what does that acronym stand for? Somebody who's Mobile virtual network operator. So what that means is somebody like Walmart can actually have a wireless network, and they're writing on top of all the carriers' other wireless networks in a virtualized manner. Right, that's, that's pretty awesome. Google Fi is basically an MVNO that operates globally across multiple carriers. Just imagine if you can do that. You suddenly in your business can create the opportunity to have your networks running anywhere, and you simply do not care where that place is. You don't care who's running it. You don't care. The network topologies that you're, they're using, the switches, the routers, you don't care about any of that stuff, right? Your network and security basically can ride anywhere globally. So we get application portability, but the side effect of that is that we get to disintermediate the specific infrastructure. We don't care if it's VMware, we don't care if it's OpenStack, we don't care if it's Amazon, we don't care if it's Google or Azure, right? That's really important. Because right now, we tend to lock ourselves into these public cloud ecosystems, right? They're big walled gardens, they're very proprietary, I'm sure you know, maybe the network piece isn't as proprietary as something like DynamoDB, but it's still different, right? The way that Amazon does security and networking is different from Azure and from Google and from your VMware deployments. The other thing about this, you know, which I said a little bit earlier, is that it's foundational, right? So if we've got this thing where we've got overlays everywhere, 
we can start to build upon them, right? We can start to add capabilities at the edge of each of these overlay networks. Maybe it's SD-WAN, maybe it's a single pane of glass where we can see our security posture globally, so on. But it means that like, if we can get it everywhere, then we can start to build additional value on top of it. So what I'm trying to say is that Juniper would like to play the game where open contrail is adopted by everyone, whether they pay us for that or not, and play for the value on top of that. Like where we want to start thinking about how we monetize open control is different than the way it's been in the past. We want to start thinking about getting it in more people's hands, making it easier to use, and instead play for adding value up the stack. So I apologize that this is a very long list, but I, I wanted to sort of say, hey, where is open control today? Where is it with the new 4.0 release? And what can it be in the future? So this is the set of requirements that I think are, are this is what we need to create a globally, uh, a, a global ubiquitous network fabric, right? It needs to be an open code and a vibrant community, which we're going to talk about some more. It needs to run everywhere, right? Public clouds, private clouds, on multiple clouds, and at the edge. It needs to not care what kind of compute it's attached to. It needs to not care what kind of infrastructure it's attached to. It needs to be easy to use and deploy, possibly one of our greatest weaknesses. It needs to have strong, transparent community governance and direction. It needs to be software defined, it needs to be highly scalable and production grade, and it needs to be technically excellent. I think we're good on the last three. So if we look at where Open Control has been, you know, historically, it's been very strong on the technical capabilities. You can read these yourselves, whether you agree with them or not. I just want to put something up there that kind of painted the landscape. Um, and it's been very good at being sort of like agnostic to the infrastructure it's running on. Um, but it hasn't been so great to use, deploy, or manage. I mean, it's a network stack. It's very complicated. I remember when we were integrating Contrail into the cloud scaling product uh, before Juniper even bought them. And my team came back to me and they said, there's more moving parts here than there is an open stack. Of course, that's less true now. There are, that was a while ago. There are many more moving parts in OpenStack these days. But the point was is that a networking stack is complicated. It just is inherently complicated. That's no excuse not to make it easier to manage and deploy, but it is complicated. And then the place where we have, you know, maybe we're technically excellent, maybe we've been good stewards of our own project, but one of the things that we definitely haven't done is figure out how to leverage the community and how to invest into the community and how to really be much more of a community-driven project. So we want to fix that. I'm going to let you read this. In order to fix that going forward with Open Contrail, you know, we need to kind of reset. We need to rethink where we were. Like, I don't want to make an incremental change. I want to, I want to make a, a revolutionary change. I want to leapfrog where we could go if we were to just make small changes and really start moving in a, in a different direction. And part of that means having kind of a new vision. This is something I put forward that's just a, a, a beginning of that, right? I mean, I think that any kind of vision that needs to be, needs to come from the community as a whole, but I'm trying to put straw men down that people can respond to. I'm trying to, you know, start us in a certain direction. And I think, you know, if this is resonating with you a little bit, then the, fir the first thing you're going to say is like, so, so what does this mean? Well, we have to reboot the open control community. And when I say reboot, reboot, I mean, you know, control alt delete, reset, wipe the disk drive, boop, right? You know, reload the operating system, reboot, right? It needs to not be Juniper rebooting the community. It needs to be the community rebooting the community. And the only way to do that is for Juniper to give up a lot of the control. And I think that's OK. And tonight at the Open Contrail Users Group, we're going we're to talk about this in a lot more detail. And I'm going to put out a call for people to come who want to participate and be part of this. You can be uh, somebody who uses Contrail today. You can be somebody who wants to develop and contribute to Con Contrail tomorrow. You can be a competitor. You can be a major customer. Like, it, all, all things are open. I remember um, you know, people came to me for the Open Contrail Day today, and they said, oh, you know, Marantis wants to present, or Marantis wants to be a part of this. That is, is, it, is it OK? And I said, yes, of course. 
Like that should no longer be a question, right? Um, so the other piece here is that we want to move towards more agnosticism, right? I, Contra already does this better than all of its competitors, right? We don't really care what the underlying system is, if, at least philosophically. But if you look at the actual sort of like code base, if you look at the documentation, a lot of it leans towards OpenStack. OpenStack's fine. We're gonna all, I mean, the carriers are going to use OpenStack till the end of time, as far as I can tell. And Juniper loves carriers, so we're going to make sure that Contra always works for the carriers uh, for OpenStack. But you know, if you look at the Contrail 4.0 release, we have native support for Kubernetes. And now we support Active Directory for authentication. I mean, we want to move in a direction, if, if we truly want Open Contrail in the hands of everybody for every infrastructure and every kind of compute, then we have to move towards more agnosticism. We have to be less centric around OpenStack. Uh, we need to you know, continue to level up in that regard. And you know, the outcome of this is that we just want to drive greater adoption. And like I said, we are going to play less for people paying us for commercial contrail support and more for the value add that we can provide on top of open contrail. So that's, that's quite a bit of difference. And it's going to uh, be hard for people to understand at first. But here's another way to think about it. Would I rather have 100 times more people using Open Contrail and have it be more ubiquitously deployed, even if I only get 10% of it? Yes, absolutely. Right? So that's the game that Juniper's playing now. I'm just being forthright about it. Because what I want is I want people who maybe to date have been a little frustrated with how the community is managed and how Juniper's kind of had it be their project to really come back and sort of reevaluate. Like, we want to play with you again. Right? I gave um, the uh, pitch you know, a, a 30 slide kind of more detailed plan that I don't have complete buy off on yet. I have, you know, directional buy off from, from the CEO, but I don't have complete uh, uh, sign off on yet to a very large carrier, um, one of our largest contract customers yesterday. And they went from being frustrated with us to saying, this is what we wanted to see. This is what we wanted you to do. And we're very excited about this. What can we do to help you? All right. So you know, this isn't a game. You know, I'm very serious about Contrail being a more open community, a healthy and vibrant com open source community, and we'd like people to come to the fold. So if you come to the Open Contrail user group tonight, I'll give you more details about how you get involved. Okay. Uh, and then finally, you know, we just SDN overlays are tough. They're complicated. Um, I think it's going to take a group of people and a community to basically make them easier to deploy, to, man to manage, to increase the quality, to have better testing and test coverage. Um, and so we need the community for, for more than just you know, engaging and driving this thing ubiquitously. We need it to increase the quality of the overall project. And that is it. Any questions? <laughs> Any quick questions? OK, somebody tell me I'm full of shit. So if you guys have any questions, please get it into the mics over there uh, so we can record them. Yes, please. You mentioned that uh, Juniper's way to monetize will be to uh, do something on top. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? What do you, um, what do you mean? We don't have a very clear picture of what that is yet, but we're looking at things like SD-WAN. We're looking at things like advanced security features. Uh, we're looking at you know sort of you know, looking at open control sort of foundational piece, which we will offer commercial support for if people want it, but we'd like our tools to ride on top of open control or contrail. Like we don't, we don't care. Um, and I don't necessarily want to tip my hand on all the things we're thinking about for obvious reasons. Uh, but the intention is that think of it as moving more towards something like an open core model where the foundational open uh, core pieces of functionality are all open, but we'll have our own commercial bits on top of it. Uh, one example right now would be AppFormix, the new acquisition that we made that does telemetry and monitoring, and it monitors Contrail, open Contrail. It doesn't care, but it's commercial bits. Uh, as one of your federal partners, I'm kind of short, so I'm not sure you guys can hear me. OK, you good? Jeez. Um, as one of your federal partners that is very much partnering with you in this area, we run into a problem with uh, people saying, yeah, Contrail, but we really want to push boxes. So when you're talking to the CEO level, how is that 
being addressed. One of the ways we're trying to address it is value on top with network service orchestration that combines orchestrating this overlay with orchestrating your legacy systems. Is that being talked about at the highest levels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, okay, uh, the short answer I tried to chart is that when uh, cloud scaling was acquired by EMC, my mission became not running the cloud scaling team, but helping EMC transform from a hardware company to a software company, until Dell bought us, okay? Uh, so my mission at Juniper is very similar, which is that uh, Rami knows that we need to, over the long term, become less of a hardware-centric company and more of a software-centric company. And if you look at a lot of the value on the Juniper boxes, historically themselves, like JunoS, it is all software. And so, you know, the, the, the business unit I'm in, which is called the Contrail Business Unit, um, which I hope gets renamed to the Cloud Software Business Unit, is software only at the moment. And there are whole software teams uh, run by people like Alex that are, are sales teams that are focused on selling software only and not on boxes. And so we're, we'll get there. The reality, though, is that, you know, you've got this go-to-market motion that's 20 years old. And so people, a lot of people in the sales organization are just used to shipping a box. But there are new parts of the business, like the control business unit, that don't get any compensation on selling boxes, don't care about selling boxes, and are focused exclusively on selling software. So we know that's where the future is. We're making the moves to get there, but it will be a slow incremental progress on that, just because you can't, you can't surprise everybody in that manner by, like, you know, uh, making a sudden drastic change. What advice do you have for partners that believe in what you're doing and want to support you? How do we get to you guys? Well, I'm super easy to find. Uh, it's our bias or randyb at juniper.net. Okay. And then I'll connect you with people like Alex and his team, which are totally focused on that. And Alex maybe can follow up with you afterwards. Um, and, but you, know, you can look at me as a conduit for that if anybody else needs to do that as well. Thank you. Sorry, my contact information's not here. This was you know, 11th hour last night at 11 p.m. while I was sniffling and you know, coughing and hacking. Uh, more questions? I only got two. I guess I'm supposed to be off soon. But. A quick oh, question. not yeah. you. Yeah. Sit down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question. <laughs> so my name is Martin, and I've been, we've been using Open Contrail since it, it, it was uh, open source, basically. So, um, but one challenge that I think some people have is um, doing the, or at least it used to be a problem, so update me if I'm wrong, going the Juniper distro is not applicable to everyone, because a lot of people want it's to not what? applicable. Like, a lot of people want to build their own, you know, kind of design. Yeah, sure. After open stack. So are you already addressing how to support people who have gone that route to basically do, to run open control somehow? Um, well, we're not going to we're not going to offer support for other people's distros. If you build your own distro, you're on your own, right? I mean, what we you know, the thing about and I wrote a, a blog post about this on my blog cloudscaling.com. The, the thing about um, what we're going to offer support for is there, it, what we're going to offer support for is always sort of like a, a pre-tested vetted you know, structure like a product, right? I mean, commercial contrail is a product. If you go and you take commercial contrail and you do whatever you want to it, it's no longer a product. It's like saying, can I get support for a hardware appliance that I've basically logged into and installed my own software on? No, because the very first time that we have an incident, I have to tell you, go put the original software on. You like you take all your, you know, bastardization off because that's a variability that I can't, I can't account for when I'm trying to troubleshoot your problem. Yeah, fine. So, yeah. but in terms but, of the community right. and how we will encourage people to build their own distros, hey, party on. Build your own distro, sell commercial support for it, whatever you want, and in fact, I hope that be in the next week, you will see us open up a lot of stuff that we had kept closed. Um, I, I think there's a good chance I'll get it done in the next week or so, and that will include all the build release process and, and tooling for building packages, as well as all the pieces for building con the new containers. And so if you want to go you know, take that stuff and use it to build your own distro or whatever, that's fine. So there still seems to be like a, a small gap that there are people using Open Contrail that would like to have like someone who can help them basically like sure well that's a that's a that's a, that's a that's a that's a business opportunity for another business juniper sells products right. and so you know that's what we're going to continue to do okay yeah i mean it's really hard to have a different business model so um for your background, having worked in the OpenStack Foundation and, and been a part of the OpenStack community for a long time, what kind of lessons learned from that community will you use for the vision of the new community? I love it. That is an excellent question. So 
Um, I don't want to get into it too much, but uh, the way that I view kind of the difference between the contract community and the open set community is that the open set community has been very, very bottoms up and very little top down command and control. And that's created its own set of problems. And Juniper's been, been very top down <laughs> and very little bottoms up. And so we'd like to chart a middle course. And what I mean by that is that I would like to see um, us fostering more people contributing to the code base um, because they're trying to get their pieces done, but continue to have some strong technical oversight and governance so it's not, you know, 100 cooks all cooking the same soup. And I think that the way that that is to be done is still TBD. One of the things that you'll see about this rebooting of the community is that I, we just don't have all the answers. We actually need everybody to come to the table and talk about it. But I've engaged the Linux Foundation, I've engaged the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and I've been talking to people like Sam Ramji, who was executive director for the Cloud Foundry Foundation, and I'm trying to get more people around the table to help us figure it out, right? Because like, there are so many different ways to build an open source community, it's not even funny, and it's been done lots of times before, and I just simply don't see any reason to make mistakes that we don't have to. So we're gonna get more people around the table who can help us think about it, and then the whole community has to sort of figure this out. But what I would very much like to see is to drive a middle course so that there is strong technical oversight um, and that we focus more on like IETF style running code and rough consensus to get stuff in, but we don't just allow any check-in willy-nilly. Like it still has to, it's the network, it has to be high quality, it needs to be production grade, it needs to be scalable. These are all things that we're good at today, I want to be even better at in the future. Um, and you know, when we set the values for the community, I hope that we are thinking about those things and it's not just like, what's the willy-nilly features I can throw into the bucket, because I don't think that helps anybody. Thank you. Yeah. I'm way over my time. I should probably wrap it up so you guys can get a little break before the next session, but I hope to see you all at the Open Contrail Users Group tonight. Thank you, Randy.